Well, we're about to start. Thank you for coming and welcome for today's seminar. Uh, once we begin, though, uh, first be very close aware of the exit signs for the doors in case we need to leave on short notice. And for those that are on the internet, uh, we strongly encourage you for the Q&A to send in your emails at first opportunity so that we can have ample time to take them before we finish the seminar. So with that, Glenn. Um, a few introductory remarks. My name is Glenn Gallagher with the California Air Resources Board. I work in the research division on fluorinated gas emission reductions. Fluorinated gases are refrigerants, uh, foam expansion agents, aerosol propellants that have extremely high global warming potentials and are potent greenhouse gases. And one of our uh, imperatives under AB 32 was to try to uh, quantify the F gas emissions or fluorinated gas emissions coming into the air. And we suspected that uh, one of the main sources was from the waste insulating foam that went into landfills. However, we really had no way to verify this, so we uh, set up a research contract and it was awarded to uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and Global Waste Research Institute. And so today we have with us uh, Dr. Nosley Yesler of the Global Waste Research Institute, Dr. Jim Hansen, a professor with Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and also on the phone, uh, they were ably assisted by Dr. Gene Bogner of the University of Illinois at Chicago, one of the world's preeminent uh, landfill emissions scientists, along with our extremely knowledgeable professors that will uh, tell us what they found when they measured fluorinated gas emissions from uh, a typical California landfill. With that, I'll uh, let you begin. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Glenn. I'm Nazli Yesseler. I will be presenting most of this material, and Jim Hansen, my co-PI, may interject here and there to add uh, some perspectives as needed, and also he'll assist with answering questions as well. And as Glenn indicated, we have Dr. Jean Bogner on the phone as well, and she might be answering some questions at the end as well. Our research team included multiple persons. The PIs are already listed, myself, Dr. Hansen, and Dr. Bogner. We had additional senior personnel, Dr. Don Blake from UC Irvine, Drs. Tracy Thatcher and Yaron Nelson from Cal Poly. We had research associates, uh, Mr. Derek Mannheim and Dr. Albadavi from Cal Poly, Dr. Mainardi from UC Irvine. The main graduate student on the investigation was Alex Son from Cal Poly, and we were assisted by a team of graduate and undergraduate students, especially in the uh, field testing portion of the program. It's my pleasure to provide our results and um, overview of the investigation today. I'll first like to start with acknowledging Waste Connections Incorporated and the staff at Potrero Hills overall for providing us access to the site for our field investigation portion and also with their assistance during all phases of the field analysis. I'd like to also acknowledge the assistance provided by our project manager, Glenn Gallagher. He was very effective in providing constructive comments throughout the investigation period. For introduction, as Glenn mentioned, the missions of various landfill gases are of interest to ARB as these can have high global warming potential. This study was conducted in particular to provide a detailed assessment of emissions of potent greenhouse gases from waste from insulation in landfills. The target gases in the investigation were hydrochloro hydrochlorofluorocarbons, also termed F gases, and specifically we had four selected chemicals in the investigation, CFC-11, HCFC-134A, HFC, I'm sorry, HCFC-141B, HFC-134A, and HFC-245FA. These chemicals are used as blowing agents in rigid foam insulation materials. And these rigid foam insulation materials are used in a variety of applications, including building insulation, appliances, transportation units, and a variety of marine applications. 
these target gases represented historical replacement practices for these types of chemicals for BAs used in, again, rigid form insulation. This was a three-phase, three-part investigation. We started with a literature review, moved to a materials flow of analysis, and also conducted an extensive field testing program. Our literature review included basic information on properties and behavior of foam products and blowing agents in the foam products. This is physical, chemical, mechanical, and thermal properties. We also looked at the types and applications of these materials and also the end-of-life management practices for foam products. We compiled data on atmospheric conditions in relation to the F gases that we investigated. We also compiled all available information on the entire life cycle of these foam products. This started with the manufacturing phase, moved into the uh, use phase, then end-of-life management practices, multiple uh, stages during that process, and also emissions from landfills. We gathered data and analysis available in the literature that related to both experimental and field investigations as well as modeling studies. We also investigated measurement of landfill gas emissions in general in detail as well. And overall, we determined that very limited data was available on emissions of F gases, very little from the U.S., and um, also on um, large-scale field studies. So that was a major finding of the literature review section. I'll move to the material flow analysis next. And in this case, we conducted a California-specific analysis. We quantified the system of waste foam flows and stocks for the period between the end of life and disposal at a landfill facility. We established the amount of blowing agent remaining in a foam material at end of life, emissions during the various stages of end of life management practices, and the BA that's remaining in the foam material at the time of disposal at a landfill. Additional details about the MFA analysis included identifying the pathways during the end-of-life management prior to landfill disposal, final disposal in the landfill. This included decommissioning, transportation, storage and stockpiling, processing such as shredding, and anything that might occur in the landfill prior to final disposal, including storage of the landfill or use as alternative daily cover material. For time periods, we looked at two separate time periods, modern and projected. The modern period went from 1960 to 2010. We termed this our scenario one. This covered the beginning and beginning to end of the use of CFCs and HCFCs, basically. The projected time period started in 1995 and lasted through 2050, and we termed the scenario two and covered the end of the use of CFCs and the uh, start of use of HCFCs and continuing into the modern time or the projected time HFCs. We looked at waste foam materials coming from five different applications. This included construction and demolition wastes. This included waste domestic appliances, refrigerators and freezers were the big category here. We looked at commercial appliances as well. Those are also refrigerators and freezers and a few additional materials. Uh, transport refrigerated units, TRUs, as well as marine and other applications. The steps that we used in analysis included um, three main categories. We identified the foam waste stock and determined the annual volumetric and mass flow of foam waste material reaching end-of-life management. We did this analysis for each category of application for those five categories in the previous slide. We also identified the end-of-life management pathways for each of these five applications. And finally, we evaluated BA emissions during each step of this um, analysis for each application. We extensively used data available from a previous study funded by ARB when we were determining the amount of uh, foam waste stock. This was a study that um, had a 2011 date and conducted by Caleb Management 
services. And the, for the other categories, we used information from uh, literature extensively. I'll show three slides that will be presenting examples for materials flow analysis. We selected uh, construction and demolition wastes. We started with determining the amount of the volume of wastes entering the waste stream and established a total amount, 445,000 cubic meters. In this case, we identified the particular type of foam material present in CND waste. And we did this for every category of application that we investigated and had a breakdown of each foam material type and associated amounts. The reason for doing that was the amount and the type of BAs in the different foam materials were different. PIR had a different composition than XPS in terms of the amount of BA. Also, the emissions from the different type of foam materials were different when we looked at the emissions uh, throughout the MFA analysis. Continuing with the CND waste example, we're looking at scenario one in this case, and one of the material types, the PIR building foams, this is uh, the continuation of the table above would be the period from 1960 to 1992. Everything was 100% CFC 11. Over time, the composition of the BA changed, and when we reached 2010, the composition was 5% HFC 245FA and 95% HC. So we considered this time-dependent change in BA, composition, in BA composition when we were doing our um, analysis for determining material flows. Our analysis for each application for each time period resulted in a um, flow chart that looks similar to this, which starts with the inputs on top. And we did this by target gas type. This was four target gases in the investigation, the CFC, the HCFC, the two HFCs of the investigation. The top box shows the input amount, the amount at end-of-life management state, at the beginning of end-of-life management stage. The black arrows pointing downward show um, material transfer to the next stage, and the red arrows pointing upward show emissions during a particular pathway of um, analysis. For CND waste, we started with the inputs. The next stage was decommissioning. The next stage was transportation and recycling. After that, until the landfill disposal, we had three different pathways that were possible. A direct transfer to landfill for disposal, a stockpiling at landfill prior to final disposal, and a shredding and then stockpiling, and then a final disposal stage. At the end, at the box at the very bottom of this slide, we still see the four gases for chemicals identified, the amounts associated with those, and in parentheses, the percentage amount remaining in the foam material with regard to the beginning input. So in this case, for CND wastes, we were looking at 92% of the initial BAs retained in the material and disposed of at the landfill. So emissions along the way were relatively low for CND wastes. For the other waste categories, actually, the emissions were somewhat lower, but for this particular case, again, the emissions were um, relatively low, and 92% of BAs ended up in the landfill. We have summary slides coming up in the next two for the entire material flow analysis, and these slides first are by application. The next slide will be by uh, blowing agent type. We have in the first column in this analysis the five different applications that we've established. We have inputs, any reuse recovery that was used, the landfill amount, the emissions that occurred between end-of-life management and disposal at the landfill. And in this category, we identified the relative contribution of the stage with the la largest amount of emissions during the end-of-life management pathway. In general, in this case, we observed that, uh, and also we have data for scenario one and scenario two, so under every category we have two columns representing the two different time periods that we investigated. In general, um, we see that larger values in each category were associated with CND and appliance wastes, the contributions from TRU waste 
and the marine and other applications were relatively low compared to the other three applications. The first three applications, and especially CND and domestic appliance waste, were the major contributors to uh, the materials flow. The bottom row shows the totals associated with the with each of these categories in the green line. And in this case, by application, we summed up all the BAs. So this includes, uh, when we look at inputs of 25 or 2,526 tons per year for scenario one, that means that that's the summation of CFC 11, HCFC 141B, HFC 134A, and um, HFC 245FA. And this applies to everything on that line. The next slide shows similar information, by, again, by BA type. In this case, instead of the application, in the first column, we have the four BAs listed. And again, we have the same additional columns, inputs, any re reuse recovery, landfill amounts, emissions. And we decided to look at the contribution of shredding, since in the previous slide, maybe I didn't mentioned that we identified that the commissioning contributed the, last, the most to emissions for CND waste, but for all other waste categories, shredding was the big contributor to emissions along the way before final landfill disposal. So in the next slide, we decided to look at uh, the shredding contribution in terms of percentage in a little bit more detail um, than in the previous slide. The bottom row in this slide is the, exactly the same as the previous slide, since the totals are the same. It's just a different presentation. In this case, we're looking at BA types rather than um, by application. For scenario one, the highest values were, as expected, associated with CFC 11. There was a lot of it in that time period. When we moved to scenario two, when we started things in 1995, there was hardly any no, CFC 11 left anymore, and we were mostly dealing with HFC 245FA. So our analysis can capture the time difference, the time change in um, BA types. We also looked at the relative amount of landfilled BAs in comparison to what we started with. So we took a ratio of the total landfill amount of BAs for scenario one with respect to the total input in scenario one. And this amounted to 64% when we did the same exercise for scenario two, we ended up with, oops, excuse me, um, a ratio of 49%. In case of emissions along the way, we determined that uh, emissions of BAs prior to landfill disposal was 13% for scenario one and slightly different at 14% for scenario two with respect to the initial inputs. The remainder of the presentation, I will basically be talking about our field investigation, which was rather extensive and um, took probably most of our time in the, in the study. Our main objectives in the investigation were to obtain quantitative data on emissions of target F gases from a landfill environment, assess the destruction efficiency of the gas control system, and also establish baseline ambient air concentrations. Our original contract, ARB's interest, was for the four target gases that I had already talked about. The Analytical testing that was conducted by UC Irvine routinely included additional F gases as well as some other gases also. So we decided to include these in our analysis also. So instead of the four F gases, we ended up analyzing 12 F gases with the additional eight that are shown over here. I will be showing data for both the four target gases and the additional gases throughout this presentation, but I will focus mostly on the um, target F gases. The additional details are in our, in our final report. And since this was a landfill study, we also have data and analysis for uh, methane and carbon dioxide as well. The F gases that we investigated are listed here with chemical names, structural formula, and principal use and principal current substitute. As I had mentioned earlier, uh, this, uh, the selection of the F gases represented historical replacement trends. We have compounds already phased out under the Montreal Protocol up top. Those are the CFCs. Then the HCFC materials, compounds currently being phased out under the Montreal Protocol. And finally, we have at the bottom the last three representing alternatives controlled under the Kyoto Protocol. 
some background information on, again, these 12 gases and methane and um, carbon dioxide with regard to current atmospheric conditions, tropospheric mixing ratio, atmospheric lifetime, and global warming potential. Uh, Dr. Bogner prepared this table using latest data available from IPCC 2013 data set, as well as some additional um, references. And if you look at this for global warming potential, carbon dioxide is at one, methane is 28 times that, and the F gases that we're interested in are at very high levels, and that's the main concern here, even though the emissions of these gases may be relatively low because of this high global warming potential issue. Uh, we wanted to understand whether if this was a significant problem or not. We conducted our investigation at Potrero Hills Landfill, which is located in Northern California. It's a landfill located in a temperate climate zone, has a um, dry and hot summer climate classification. It's uh, located in an area with an average daily air temperature on the order of 16 degrees Celsius. For 2013 and 2014, the average rainfall was 1.27 millimeters per day which amounted to an average of about 407, 470 millimeters per year. This is a class three facility that has been operation since 1987. They receive different types of waste materials that includes residential waste, commercial waste, CND wastes, industrial waste, agricultural waste, green waste, and a variety of different types of special wastes. The disposal I will show a map in just a moment. And if we can keep the questions to the end, please. Thank you. The disposal area, again, at the site is 138 acres. Um, the volume in place at the time, hectares, I'm sorry, uh, at the time of our investigation was 19 million cubic meters. The average daily waste intake at the facility is on the order of 3,000 tons. And the waste intake in 2013 was on the order of 920,000 tons, which was about 3% of the uh, waste generation in California, if we converted it to California values. The site was selected due to a number of reasons. We had uh, medium-high disposal capacity, substantial amount of CND waste that was on the order of 16% um, for the last several years, uh, based on their site records. They were using a high amount of alternative daily cover materials, including both green waste, CND wastes, and auto fluff. Um, there was presence of appliance waste at the site. They were accepting appliance wastes. There were different cover types and waste with different ages present at the site. There was an operational landfill gas management system, and uh, very importantly, high level of cooperation and assistance from the site management and stuff. And identification of a site and uh, working with the site may appear straightforward, but that's, it's actually a rather complicated process, and we ended up starting the field portion a little bit later than the next season than what we had originally intended because of uh, some changes in direction, changes in site selection, and uh, we're, we're very happy at the end because of the um, high cooperation that was provided, cooperation and support provided by the Potrero Hills site. This is now the location of the site. It's almost halfway between Sacramento and San Francisco. It's in Susan City, close to Vacaville. That's the uh, location of the site. We designed our uh, field testing program to obtain data from all cover types at the landfill facility, which included the daily cover, interim cover and final cover to assess the effects of cover type and cover condition on emissions. We also targeted locations um, with waste of varying ages that are present underneath the different cover types that we tested. So we wanted to see waste age effects on emissions as well. And finally, we did testing in different seasons to investigate effects of climatic conditions on emissions. Our field test programs, most of our time and effort was spent on emissions testing, of course, and included the use of static flux chamber method for determining um, the emissions. 
We also established the ambient air concentration using the static flux chamber method. The first reading provided us the ambient air concentration. And for destruction efficiency, we sampled the upstream and downstream of the gas from the gas flare domain metal management system that they were using. We conducted additional tests also, which included subsurface gas sampling, temperature of the cover systems, uh, density of the covers using sand cone, and we sampled the cover materials for further classification analysis in the laboratory using a variety of geotechnical analysis techniques. Here's an image of the um, static flux chambers that we used. We selected these to obtain direct measurement of emissions and use very large chambers for this investigation. Typically, these are uh, much smaller devices. Um, we went with the one meter by one meter area and uh, 30 centimeter deep or high chambers. We did four chamber tests at a given location for statistical significance, so we repeated our tests. We have data for, from multiple uh, chambers at a given location. Starting with the deployment of the chambers, these were made of um, stainless steel, so they were relatively difficult to move around. We needed multiple people to, starting from the upper left side, moving the base, the color of the chamber in place, then we pounded it into ground, and we actually used the bentonite paste around the outer as well as the inner perimeter of the chamber to seal it against any kind of um, leak prior to placing the cap on the chamber, and then we secured the cap in place and actually started taking measurements immediately. A little bit close up of the chamber in this next figure, we have special to design and constructed fittings and uh, ports for obtaining our samples. We collected the gas samples using evacuated two liter cylinders provided to us by uh, the laboratories at UC Irvine and then sent our samples back to them for analytical testing. We conducted our gas flare testing um, by collecting samples from the inflow raw gas intake to the flare system, and we sent Dr. Thatcher up to the top of the flare to collect a downstream gas sample from a location near a sampling port near the top of the flare. It was mid-high. The additional tests included, um, we see a photo that was part of our drilling process for inserting our temperature control sensors in the cover system on the left side and on the right side, actually Dr. Hansen conducting a sand cone test to determine the density of the uh, cover materials that were included in the, in the test program. For laboratory analysis, um, we have some pictures of um, some of the tests that we did. Sieve analysis we used to identify particle size distribution. We determined the specific gravity of the materials. We wanted to establish all phase relations for our cover soils or cover materials. We used standard equipment for the soil materials. We had to use some specialized equipment for the larger size particle uh, daily cover materials. And finally, pictures of hydrometer and Atterberg limits analysis that we used to determine um, the size fraction and plasticity characteristics of the fine portions in, a, in our cover soils. Additional details about um, our field testing, I will go over some information related to locations, cover types, waste stages, and season analysis in the upcoming several slides. For our um, field testing locations, we conducted our testing at a total of seven locations. This included three daily cover locations, three interim cover locations, and one final cover location. These were located in different cells at the site, all of our daily cover tests were conducted in cell 12, which was the active site at the time of our or active cell at the time of our investigation. Each of cells 1, 10, and 15 had interim covers, so in each cell we established an interim cover test location, and uh, the final cover was placed in parts of cell 1, and we did our final cover tests at cell 1. In each location, we deployed, again, four 
um, chambers. So in a given season, we had a total of 28 deployments. In two seasons, we did our testing in wet and dry season. We ended up with 56 deployments of the chambers for the project and overall collected, including some soil samples, gas flare, uh, raw gas, and et cetera, nearly 300 gas samples overall for analysis. The cover profiles at the different locations that we investigated, the top three figures or sketches represent the daily cover locations, the bottom three are intermediate covers, and the one on the right side is the profile for our final cover. For daily covers, we had three different materials. AF stands for auto fluff, GW is the green waste, ED is an extended daily cover, a material that was left in place not as long as the interim covers, but longer than the daily covers and had a little thicker profile and consisted of a soil material. The intermediate covers in cells 1, 10, and 15 Overall, were, um, the, the IC1 was an entirely fine-grained soil, a high plastic clay material. The other two were um, classified as coarse-grained materials but had appreciable amounts of clay in them as well. And finally, the, fi the final cover location, the soil was very similar to the intermediate cover location and on the surface had some gravel in it, but below that underneath that was basically the fat clay or the uh, high plastic clay throughout. In terms of thicknesses, the daily covers were relatively thin, the intermediate covers were thicker, and finally the highest thickness was associated with the uh, final cover material. An image of some of the loose materials, um, starting with the top left corner here is the autofluff, a mixture of uh, different sized particles, the final cover material, two examples of the green waste during the dry season and the wet season, the extended daily cover, the clayey material, which had a lot of gravel in it, and finally the um, high plasticity clay material, which was the uh, interim cover material. Cover properties, we have a listing of all the cover types in the first column, and basically we use two types of different classification systems, both the Unified Soil Classification System and the USDA, the Department of Agriculture Classification System, to identify the um, categories of these materials. For the first two, auto fluff and green waste, they're non-soil materials, so there's no classification. The others, um, Jim and I understand the USCS classification much more than the USDA, so I'll go with that one. Um, for extended data cover, again, it was a poorly graded gravel with clay and sand. The IC1 was a fat clay, a high plasticity clay. IC10 and 15 were clayey sand with gravel, and finally the final cover was also a fat clay near the surface had gravel, but didn't have the gravel um, as we went down into the ground with depth. Additional information on cover properties, this is a lot of, um, again, geotechnical information. We determined the specific gravity. Uh, we measured moist density. We were able to calculate dry density. We determined water content, degree of saturation, S, and porosity and void ratio of these samples. Two things to look at here is in the wet season, the water content and the degree of saturation are much higher than is expected, the values associated with the dry season measurements. And in some cases, some of the materials were very stiff and dense. The extended daily cover was probably a surprise in that regard. The kind of density that we measured for that is really extraordinary, I think, for a field application. We also have uh, information on the waste ages. This is looking at the seven different locations and the height of the waste, the depth of the waste underneath the measurement location and also the age of waste. We classified based on data that we obtained from historical site records. We looked at a lot of uh, topographic maps going as far back as possible and identified four ranges of ages associated with our um, waste materials, 0 to 4 year old waste, 4 to 14 year old waste, and 14 to 29 year old waste. And at each measurement location, starting with the left side on top, auto fluff, underneath auto fluff there was approximately 54 
meters of waste. The top 12 meters of this waste had an age of approximately zero to four years, and below that, the waste age is on the order of four to 14 years. We did this exercise for each location in our analysis and tried to use this information for, again, making correlations to uh, waste age and or correlations between waste age and emissions. A summary slide which shows, again, the three different types of daily covers, the interim covers, the three different types of interim covers, and the final cover, the materials, and the ages associated with those materials in the analysis. And these are based on everything else provided so far. For seasonal testing, we repeated our tests in the wet and the dry season. The wet season corresponded to uh, measurements that we conducted in multiple trips between February and April 2014. And the dry season was, all of our testing was done in August 12, 2014. You can see the difference in the site conditions by looking at the pictures, the vegetation. Our very first testing date on site was the stop um, figure in February 2014 uh, it was the day of the deluge. It felt like the entire 470 millimeters of rain fell on the site during that day and was one of probably the toughest um, field days of investigation that we ever conducted. For analytical testing, um, our Data analysis was conducted at UC Irvine, Roland Blake Laboratories. This is a photo showing multiple gas chromatographers. It actually represents only a very small portion of the capabilities and the laboratory down there. It's an extensive facility with um, a very large um, scale operation able to test numerous samples at a given time and able to detect chemicals to very low levels, and that was the main reason why we wanted to work with their laboratory. For the chemicals that we investigated, the 12 F gases, the limit of detection was on the range of parts per trillion for every case. I'll move to now how we analyzed our emissions data to determine surface flux. Um, we obtained concentrations at the end of the analytical investigation of our gas samples. We converted the um, concentration to flux using the slopes of the concentration versus time plots that we obtained and uh, used the initial chamber measurement at time zero to establish the ambient concentrations at the landfill surface. I will go over some example plots in the next few slides. The concentration versus time data looked something like this. In each chamber, we started taking measurements at time zero and continued to take measurements over a time period. And that time period ranged from, um, I think the lowest was about 60 minutes. 60 to 150. 60 to 150, so from one hour to two and a half hours. And we had multiple points um, for the concentration versus time data. We started by fitting linear lines to the data that we obtained, to the entire data set that we obtained in the testing program. In this case, we have the diamonds representing the original data set. And in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five measurements. It's a 60-minute test. And our square value was 0 0.87. We determined that we wanted to use our square values that were above 0 0.9. So we decided to take one point off from the end and recalculated the slope of the line and in this case ended up with an R square value of 0 0.99. We did this exercise as necessary for our fire data sets and removed one or two data points from the end until we reached an R square value above 0 0.9. If in some cases, if this did not happen, we actually um, disregarded that data set and did not use it in our final uh, presentations. This occurred, the cases where we couldn't reach R square 0.9 were generally associated with cases where we had very low concentrations. So it did not occur when we had appreciable amounts of flow, but in cases where we had very, very low flow, we sometimes had difficulty, again, um, establishing a slope for this 
relationship. We calculated the destruction efficiency of the flare system by looking at the inflow and outflow, incoming and outgoing um, concentrations, by looking at the difference of those with regard to what's coming in and multiplying it with 100. And at the next slide, I will start going over results of our field testing program. This will start with ambient concentrations, then we'll look at surface emissions, and finally, uh, look at destruction efficiency of the flare system. For ambient concentrations, this is one example data set. This is data from Autofluff in the wet season. Again, we're listing all the 12 F gases that we investigated and uh, methane and carbon dioxide in this table. And we have results associated with all of the four chambers that we used in the analysis. After looking at all of the data, which is presented in a format similar to this, we made some conclusions related to ambient concentrations. The um, methane and carbon dioxide concentrations, as expected, were quite a bit larger than the trace components, the F gases. There was high variability between constituents, test locations, and seasons. At a given test location for the F gases, the variations were on the order of two to five orders of magnitude. The highest concentrations for the trace gases were associated, for the F gases were associated with the auto fluff and green waste covers. For seasonal changes, again, there was high variation, zero to five orders of magnitude for F gases. The highest seasonal variations occurred for the auto fluff and the green waste cover again. And finally, the concentrations in the wet season were somewhat higher than the concentration in the dry season, but not as many orders of magnitude as the uh, variations with constituent or test location. Surface flux result. This is um, this image is showing again a example data set, all 12 F gases plus CH4 and CO2, results from the four chambers, and we identified for each um, constituent the minimum and maximum. This is a set of results from the extended daily cover and dry season results. We have generated tables like this for all of the different cover systems and the wet and the dry seasons. Some um, summary information related to this, there was high variability between test locations and this went up to approximate six orders of magnitude and you can see that this was observed for CFC 11 and the first um, bullet. And in general, the fluxes that we measured for the F gases were less than the fluxes we measured for CH4 and CO2. And variations at a given location were less than variations between locations typically. The variations at a given location were less than two orders of magnitude generally, and mostly, actually, they were within the same order of magnitude. We also represented our results um, in bar charts. This is an example data set for CFC 11 in wet season. In this case, we have the flux on the y-axis, and the x-axis represents the different cover materials, starting with the daily covers, the auto fluff, green waste, extended daily, moving to the intermediate covers, IC1, IC10, and IC15, and finally at the end, data for the final cover. This is again CFC 11 wet season. In general, for all of our data sets, we um, determined that as we moved from the daily cover to intermediate cover to the final cover, the flux values decreased. Typically, the highest flux values, the maximum flux were associated with the auto fluff, and the lowest values were associated with either the final cover or the interim cover one. The interim cover and the final cover were made of the same material, the high plasticity clay, and, and we think that that was the reason why um, those two were providing very similar results. It's worth noting on this graph that the y-axis is a log scale. Demonstrating significant, demonstrating significant differences between the uh, cover types. Uh, what I indicated before the mic was on was that the y-axis on this plot is a log scale. Some 
So many comments related to the uh, measured flux values. This is now a table showing the um, covered material type in the first column and the four target gases in the next set of columns and minimum and maximum values for each um, of the target gases. When we look at the daily covers, the overall flux values that we measured range from all the way down to 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 1 grams per meter square per day in that general range. When we move to the next round of materials, the interim covers, the range was on the order of 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 4 grams per meter square per day. And finally, when we looked at the final cover data, uh, the only measurements that we could get were on this 10 to the minus 7 order. We had some below detection limit measurements and some of this inconclusive data, the data set that didn't meet the R square above 0 0.9 criteria, which again was associated with very, very low concentrations. A summary of the cover factors that affected flux. Emissions decreased with the order as we moved from daily to intermediate to final covers, from high to moderate to low permeability covers, and also from low thickness to moderate thickness to high thickness covers. So there was significant effect of the cover material on the measured emissions. We did some comparisons to literature. We looked at um, previously obtained data sets on municipal solid waste using static flux chamber measurements, and we were able to conduct our comparisons only three of the four target gases because there was no prior data available for HFC 245FA in the literature. We first started by comparing our entire data set to the literature values, and for all three chemicals in this case, under all data, our measured ranges were higher than the ranges reported in the literature. Then we looked at the literature a little bit more carefully and realized that there was nothing reported from daily covers. Everything was coming from either interim covers or final covers, so we excluded our uh, higher values that were associated with daily covers and looked at the comparisons again and uh, realized that the CFC 11, our measured ranges were about one order of magnitude lower than what was reported in literature for HCFC 141B. The measured ranges were about the same and for F HFC 134 FA, 134A, our range was up to two orders of magnitude higher than what was reported in the literature. The literature studies were conducted in the mid to early 2000s or early to mid 2000s, so at least uh, 10, 15 years before our investigation, and we think that these trends actually very well captured the historic replacement of the hydrofluorocarbons in wastes, and we were very happy to see these um, results. Looking at seasonal variations, we prepared a table where we compared the um, measurements obtained in different seasons. We have listed our cover types in the first column, the materials, and looked at the percentage of constituents greater than one versus the other season. If we look at the last two columns, the percentage of constituents greater than the wet season are identified with the purple, and when we look at the total of seven measurement locations, seven different types of materials, the four were greater in the wet season, the emissions from the four were greater in the wet season than the dry season. So overall in our measurement uh, program, we determined that the emissions in the wet season were somewhat greater than the dry season. We further investigated this and tried to look at some mechanisms that may be responsible for this. We determined that the seasonal variations were a function of the cover material type we observed opposite effects for low versus medium high permeability materials. For the low permeability materials, emissions in the dry season actually were higher than the emissions in the wet season. We observed the opposite trend for the medium high permeability materials. Emissions in the wet season were higher than the emissions in the dry season. Data in the literature, some um, previous measurements, especially on methane, typically agreed with this first 
set of results, the dry season emissions being larger than the wet season emissions. But again, most data available in the literature is from lower permeability materials and not much available from daily covers and such. And I think that's the reason why um, we were seeing these differences due to the permeability of the materials as well as some other characteristics. For the low permeability materials, we think that the combined high degree of saturation and the high flow path tortuosity occluded pores, small amount of interconnected pores resulted in relative low emissions in the wet season. For the medium and high permeability materials, combined high temperature, high activity of the uh, biological components, potential high levels of oxidation, and increased sites for absorption in the dry season ended up with um, giving us low emission values in the dry season. Overall, these are rather complex processes, and there are many factors that affect the uh, emissions in the end. Finally, the last um, set of tests before going to the flare system. Uh, destruction efficiency is uh, the emissions with waste stage. We're looking at a plot of um, waste stage on the x-axis and flux on the y-axis. We took maximum flux values from our measurements and plotted those against the waste stages that we determined. The four chemicals are listed in this chart, and overall we observed that the flux values decreased as the waste age increased. This effect was particularly pronounced for one of the newest materials, the HFC 245FA, which was an up and coming material. We didn't expect to see much of it in really old ways, and there really wasn't much there. And then as time went on for the newer ways, for the more recent materials, there was more um, HFC 245FA coming out of the system. The differences were somewhat less for the other materials. Again, Jim may say that this is, again, a log axis. So even if there is well, a slight difference that's observed, it's because of the log scale, it's more than what it may appear to be. CFC 11 was somewhat low at the early stages, a little bit higher for medium age waste, and then lower again at the end, again, in line with some of the historical replacement trends. I'll add one point to that, and that relates to this trend capturing both the materials flow of what is available to be in landfills at a given time that Nasli mentioned, as well as the processes that are ongoing while the material is banked in the landfill, meaning an older waste mass would have already gone through uh, the process of emission, some diffusion and advection and so on of these chemicals, uh, and there would not be as high a source at a later time than there would be in the younger waste. Uh, finally, looking at the flare system destruction efficiency, this is a table again showing the uh, compounds that we investigated, the chemicals that we looked at, the 12 F gases, CH4 and CO2. The destruction efficiency is listed at the end. And for all of these gases, the destruction efficiency was above 99.47%. For the four target F gases, uh, the flare system efficiency was above 99.88%. So the system was very effective in um, destroying, destructing the um, chemicals collected in the landfill gas at the site. The last set of um, slides that I will be going through that relates to our investigation, the field investigation, relate to what we call the scaled emissions. We went through a three-step process to uh, expand the data that we obtained to the entire site. We looked at minimum and maximum emissions for each gas and scaled those for the entire site using the relative aerial proportions of the cover types. At the time of our investigation, daily covers approximately were over 3% of the site. We divided this equally between the three different daily cover materials. The intermediate covers occupied about 84% of the site. Again, we divided this equally between the three different intermediate covers. And the final cover was over uh, approximately 13% of the site. We determined or we converted area specific emissions in grams per meter square per day to total emissions using the molecular masses of the chemicals and the relative areas occupied by the different cover components and provided estimates for CO2 equivalent emissions for the entire site. The maximum emissions were on average about an order of magnitude or so higher than the uh, minimum emissions. 
and that the CO2 equivalent total emissions were higher by one order of magnitude in the dry than the wet season. And overall, when we looked at the F gases alone, the emissions of uh, CFC 11 were quite a bit higher than the emissions of the other F gases. Overall, the magnitude and relative contributions of the F gas emissions were exacerbated when we did this conversion to CO2 equivalents rather than um, leaving the gases as they are. A set of results associated with this analysis will be showing up in the next um, several slides. We have the chemicals listed in the first column and the surface emissions minimum and maximum values associated with those in the next columns. We have the total life gas emissions, the total surface emissions, and we have two sets of tables for this. Um, this first table was what we included in the draft uh, report and we actually made a little bit of change and uh, generated new tables by excluding the CO2, only concentrating on CH4 and the other gases as well. We, when we look at everything uh, for the wet season, the relative contributions of the F gases for minimum emissions were on the order of 23 percent, for maximum emissions were about 5 percent. When we excluded the CO2, the contribution of the F gases for the minimum uh, measurements were on the order of 75 percent, on the order of 6 percent for maximum emissions. When we did this, the same analysis, oh, when we, I'm sorry, did the analysis for total emissions for um, the dry season with the CO2 in place, we had <coughs> contributions of 0 0.3 and 1.3 percent for minimum and maximum emissions. For the dry season, without CO2, the contributions were on the order of 0 0.4 to 1.7 percent, again, minimum and maximum emissions. And when we looked at total emissions, we combined the data from dry and wet seasons by looking at how much of the site was experiencing dry conditions in a given year versus wet conditions. The overall annual contributions with CO2 in place was on the order of 4 and 3.3 percent for minimum and maximum emissions. And when we took the CO2 out, it was about 5.6 and 4.2 percent. Last two slides for making some conclusions from our investigation. Overall, we determined that there was very limited data in literature on emissions of F gases from landfills. Uh, there was absolutely no data on HFC uh, 245FA and limited data for the other gases. In the material flow analysis, we determined that most of the BAs in the foams at end of life remained in the foams at time of disposal at the site. The emissions were quite a bit less than 50%. Uh, a lot of the, again, BA present at the time of end of life was remaining in the material at time of landfill disposal. The, our field testing program was very extensive in terms of determining F gas emissions from a landfill system. The measured ambient air concentrations were in the 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 uh, parts per trillion range for the F gases that we measured. The range was larger on the order of 10 to the 9 for methane and carbon dioxide. The raw gas concentration in parts per trillion again was somewhere between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 6 for the F gases and higher for uh, much higher for the CO2 and CH4 again. The destruction efficiency for the four target gases were over 99.88%. The emissions were overall highly variable throughout the site, and uh, they were generally higher through the daily covers than the intermediate and final covers. The emissions decreased with decreasing hydraulic conductivity or permeability and increasing cover thickness. And the seasonal differences in emissions varied by cover type. It was a complex process and influenced directly by the cover type. Some implications and directions for future research. Well, again, the emissions were highly determined to be highly variable due to different cover conditions, underlying race conditions, age and depth, and seasonal variations. The overall contribution of gases to total greenhouse gas emissions from the landfills, in our case, 
varied with season and potentially could be significant. Some of the measurements for the uh, low end of emissions when we took the CO2 out were relatively significant. And the emissions of FGAS are expected to vary also by landfill location, including the effects of both climatic conditions and potential operational conditions. Also, with time to account for further changes in the waste stream as these chemicals evolve and different types of um, BAs and other types of things are used in uh, foam formulations. And we, in general, think that data from other landfills and in particular data from, this is again a point that we didn't have in the draft report, alternative or evapotranspirative covers are important to obtain. I'm not familiar with um, much in the way of investigation of emissions from these types of covers, and there is a movement in California also towards these covers because they're very effective hydraulically, and it would be something, I think, important to check in terms of their effectiveness in um, gas emissions as well. So this concludes our presentation, and at this time, I think we will be opening to um, questions and take questions from uh, that might be coming from um, anybody watching on the internet as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nasli and Jim, for that for that presentation. It's uh, you did some great work there, and and you know, the Air Resources Board is really really grateful for all of your research and findings, and we think this is going to have some some pretty meaningful uh, implications for our policy as we go forward on our, our uh, fluorinated gas emissions reductions. Um, I do have a question on. Uh, did you come to any conclusions on the trends in projected emissions? I mean, would they would they decrease as as time goes by because the the, the highest global potential uh, F gases are no longer in foam, or because there's such a delay between buildings being built and demolished? Do you think it might increase in the near future? Um, I think we will still be getting significant amount of emissions for um, extended periods of time because of, as you indicated, relatively long lifetimes of a number of the components that contribute to the emissions, especially buildings. Appliances have shorter lifetimes, but buildings have relatively long lifetimes. So I think there will still be um, a lot of CFC 11 or other types of CFCs coming into the system because of uh, the I'm trying to go back to the slide which had um, the relative uh, percentages or relative global warming potentials, but I'm, I'm I don't know where this. I think it's a little further back. It was at the beginning of uh, here. It is. So um, some of the materials, the replacement materials that are at the bottom here have lower global warming potential values, but these are still not really close to one. They're still fairly high, and I, as I said, I think there will still be um, a lot of materials coming in from um, especially the buildings that will continue to contribute to um, the levels that will, I think, potentially stay at about where we're at, and maybe transition more towards the later materials. Again, the, the comparison to literature was, I think, very interesting in terms of how our values compared to measurements from 10, 15 years ago, and perhaps in another 10, 15 years, um, the HFCs will be even further along than what the levels are now, and less in way of CFC 11 and some of the HCFCs. But again, it's it's hard to say. I'll add one point to that uh, related to potential long-term processes in these banked materials. And this would relate both to those materials in service as well as those that are in the landfill system, which we determined through that MFA were significant in terms of quantity. And there could be a breakdown of the structure of these foams with time, therefore higher amounts of diffusion with time through these materials. Uh, that could 
come at certain threshold periods. I'm not that familiar with the product, the structure of these. I'm coming from a soil perspective. But from the foam perspective, I think there's an integrity of the material itself at play here. And all that bank material will be emitted at some time in the future. It's likely not going to stay there forever. So uh, it's just a matter of waiting for that to happen. And possibly there could be some thresholds where it would actually come out in relatively large quantities when there's a suitable breakdown of the structure of the foam. Um, okay, I, I have another question. Uh, it, it looks like, um, from my point of view, one of the significant findings was that the percentage of the F gases as total greenhouse gas emissions from landfills, and that, based on your literature review, did that approximate 3% percentage surprise you, or was that uh, in line with what was expected? Was it higher, lower? Was it... Uh, the this relates to the carbon CO2 equivalent or? Yeah, the CO2 equivalent um, specifically. We did not compare the CO2 equivalent to anything in the literature. I don't know if they have converted anything, and I'm not sure if we have sufficient information to do exact comparisons because we need to know the relative proportions of the uh, areas occupied by the different cover systems that were tested, and we did not look at the literature in that detail to see if they had reported um, the, again, relative amounts of the different cover systems to be able to conduct an analysis similar to, to what we did. So I'm, I'm not able to so, answer that. So your study was uh, probably the first to actually do that comparative I, I, CO2 equivalent. I think equivalent. we did beyond what a lot of studies had done. I think we looked at um, a lot of things in great detail. And because this was a report, maybe sometimes it, some of this may have been done, but maybe it was in a report or something like that somewhere that we haven't been able to identify it in, in papers published in the literature. Again, you may not always get exact details about the waste ages or the um, areas of cover systems, the types of materials. Even sometimes it's just said that it's a interim cover. We're not entirely sure, perhaps, exactly what the interim cover had. So um, try to dig up as much information as possible, but did not did not do a comparison to the total converted emissions. Yeah, this is Chuck White. I'm a private consultant. I, I have, have a couple questions. Um, I, you said that there's a potential for release of these F gases, but the numbers seem to be indicate that it's relatively small, at least compared with the methane concentrations. And so I can't remember, it was about 10% or thereabouts, mm -hmm. I think that's... Most of the time, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, um, and I guess my question is then, do you consider that to be a signif potentially significant, or is it significant, or it could be significant? <laughs> I guess I didn't quite... I, I kind of thought it's, 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 it's not insignificant, certainly, but it's, it's nothing, something that we should be wringing our hands about at this point in time. About that, Chip? Sure. I'll, I'll give that a shot. Uh, the situation that was probably most pronounced was that for the wet season in which the ratios were on the order and it would be for the minimum so during low periods of emissions but the minimum values measured at the site were between 5 and 24 percent ish i'm not sure i have during the, the numbers exactly but during the wet season and when CO2 is removed from that equation, which is fairly common in these sorts of analyses with international Ogenic. standards. Correct, yes. And it, it's difficult to actually say that that is coming from the waste mass itself or from the landfill. That number bumps all the way up to 75% being from F gases. That was the one data point that really highlighted and said, boy, this in certain seasons, certain conditions, it could be a significant fraction. So we were careful with that word. We realized we're in a regulatory house here. Right. And, you know, it, it's, we're trying to apply science and have it be, you know, engineering findings here and not get into the political stratum on this. But we thought that 75% due to F gases was worth the word significant. And that's because of the relative global warming potential. Yes, that's Particularly correct. of the older exactly. F gases. Mm -hmm. That's right, yes, yeah. exactly. Got it. And um, in terms of managing 
these kinds of foams, it seems to me you have basically three options. You either dispose of it in the landfills you evaluated or you combust it in some kind of incineration device and or you break it down and try to recycle the foams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it's always been my sense that probably combustion makes the most sense if, if the combustion actually has a high rate of destruction efficiency of these F gases. And I don't remember if there's much literature uh, on that uh, that I recall. I know, I, I think there's, and, and then the speculation would be if you're recycling the foam, you're, you're, you're breaking those bubbles up and really releasing the gases mm -hmm. at a high rate, right? because you're not after the F gases, you're after the basic plastic structure that goes into those foams. And so you would need to capture all those released gases during that recycle, which is something very limited in practice right now, and you'd have to do something much more extensive to if you were going to be recycling all those plastic materials. So I guess my sense was that some years ago when we first started looking at this that it makes potentially makes sense to continue disposal practices, particularly if the F gases are going to be becoming less global, having a lower global warming potential over time rather than try to get man, go into a massive program to try to recycle and capture all the gases. And, and there isn't any option for c combusting these kinds of things right now, other than a couple of grandfathered incinerators that exist. So I, I just, uh, I guess one, if you had a sense of, uh, of, you didn't really compare the other management options, you just looked at landfills almost exclusively, mm -hmm. that, that's correct? Um, y yes, that's correct. But when we were doing the material flow analysis, um, especially for appliances, there was quite a bit of shredding that was yeah. used also. And uh, our understanding is that in the U.S., those facilities do not really have strict emission controls, meaning the BAs are not really captured or managed. They're just uh, during the shredding process, whatever is released is released. And when we looked at the beginning amounts at the end of life and what's coming into a landfill, I showed CND waste example, but the numbers were actually lower when we looked at the domestic appliances. So there was quite a bit being lost during that shredding stage, which again is not really controlled in the US and likely in the recycling case also. Shredding, I think, we may have encountered that more than recycling. Recycling perhaps wasn't um, as high as the, the shredding option. And uh, that's probably a place where uh, some um, influence can be had if those facilities are controlled a little bit better. But as you said, if the waste stream is going to change significantly and at some point the incoming chemicals are not as bad as uh, what's available currently maybe, or what, what was available in the past, maybe this is not, I'm, I'm not sure. Now you mentioned there was very little lit historic literature when this whole thing got started about three or four years ago, I remember doing, getting a bunch of maybe five or six studies that were done by, I think, Swedish researchers. Danish. Uh, Danish There's yeah, a lot of exactly. data yeah, and analysis and, and from I, Denmark. We use their information their names a lot. Were the same on all, virtually all the papers, and, they, mm -hmm. and I, I guess your findings are seem to be somewhat consistent. Although they reached the conclusions, I recall that they felt there was some, there could be some kind of mechanism of attenuation of these materials, not just simply being locked up in the landfill, mm -hmm. but could actually be, be degraded in the landfill over time, although they said that further research would, I believe they said, would need, would need to be done on whether or not it's just being stored or if it's being fully more attenuated through some kind of destruction mechanism. But you, you didn't have any sense of, of that, really. We did not get into that. And as you had indicated, I think some of their um, Estimates were based on some modeling studies, and they had some supporting laboratory investigations, perhaps, but not a whole lot from uh, maybe field investigations right. in terms of understanding the mechanisms fully. So we did not really uh, make any guesses or estimates on how much may be transformed in a landfill environment, and if something is being lost, um, mitigated in the landfill environment itself. We did not really um, consider that. We had some discussion with Professor Don Blake at UC Irvine about this process of the foams or the BAs in the landfills. And the gases, the con constituents, can actually be converted to other constituents, which, which can be just as bad or worse. Bad. So <laughs> the you know target chemical could go away, but it could be turning into something just as bad. And I don't know the details and chemical names of that offhand here, yeah. but 
there is some concern in that regard that attenuated doesn't mean wash your hands yes, and uh, there's no uh, concern yeah. whatsoever. It's still in there in, in some form. So I, that would require further study. And then the last question I had, at the end, your last conclusion was a cover type you thought that had particularly, was particularly effective and you, I think you said it was becoming in more practice, but so for some reason I missed what that cover type was. Uh, alternative covers, the uh, evapotranspirative covers, monolithic covers, uh, rather than the low permeability materials, uh, the covers that like they a, make like with... Like a clay the, or like a synthetic... Um, no, none of those. The covers that have a uh, relatively deep layer of a single layer of soil, generally a silty, sandy silty type of material, or uh, ones that have a capillary break that consists of two materials, one on top of the other, which is a coarser material and the finer material, but not really fine grain, not a regular cover, uh, which has a... A low permeability material, either a fine grained soil or a combination of fine grained soils and a geosynthetic clay liner or a compacted clay liner or something like that. These are just only soil materials, no synthetics in them, and they are very effective hydraulically and could be effective for gas transport also, but I don't, again, think that there is enough data to say. Um, so was it there? They're effective hydraulically, excuse me, uh, in arid regions. In arid and regions, they yes. Are, it's a relatively high, highly pervious system. And, That's why, uh, and it works when it's dry. And if it rains, there'll be shedding of that moisture. Once they're saturated, they'll actually have a quite a bit of flow. But in arid regions, they work well because they, don't get they remain in that dry condition. And an air bubble inside that pore structure will act just like a solid and water will shed away from it. Uh, however, this air allows for air passage or gas passage, and these have not yet been identified or studied in this I guess regard. I'm missing something, because if, if they're relatively permeable, why wouldn't the gases still move up through this? We think they will. They oh. might. Uh, they and, might. Or, and there's potential for it to be oxidized. It might be a good system for oxidation. Oxidizing the, the gas. Gases. Uh, but again, And methane and know. so on. Any. Yeah. It's, it's just, I don't think there's much um, in these kinds of cover systems uh, in the literature that we know of. So that's something interesting that's, again, I think something that should be verified well, on There's a, a whole debate scale. going on about how well covers work on controlling methane to begin with, and there's a whole lot of research being done by Jeff Chanton and Barlaz back east on, uh, on ways to increase methane oxidation mm -hmm, and covering mm -hmm. cover materials from landfills to further reduce those emissions. We have uh, an emailed uh, question. There are two questions. I'll just read them and let uh, Nosley or, or Jim answer them. Uh, first question. How representative would you expect the emission rate results to be relative to landfills located in different climate conditions, for instance, to more temperate climates in the eastern United States? And the second question is, what effect does the presence of the gas collection and combustion system have on fugitive emission rates in comparison to a landfill without such a collection control system? So. Um, the first part, the effects of um, climatic conditions, I guess this was one of our recommendations. I think some more study is needed to be able to um, provide a definitive answer to this part of the question. Um, I think there will be differences as the temperatures change, as the moisture conditions in the cover systems change. So it's, I think we would expect to see um, differences in different climatic regions. These results would apply to, I think, landfills located in similar regions with similar um, operational conditions, but I don't think that they would necessarily apply 100% to landfills in different climatic regions, and that's something that can be verified, proved or disproved with, I think, further testing and uh, further extensive testing in other climatic regions. I would add to that that Nosley and I have personally worked on uh, thermal aspects of landfills for about 18 years now. And uh, we have determined that 
most all landfill processes are a function of temperature and therefore would be a function of climate conditions as well. And we've identified deeper than just temperature that precipitation has a major impact on landfill behavior. And I'll just leave it at that of many processes being impacted uh, without getting into details. And the second part of the question, Jim, do you want to address that? And I actually wanted to give perhaps Jean some time also to say a few things and maybe she can um, join in with this one also. I'd say we did not have a control site and variable site in the case to compare directly gas collection combustion systems to others. Uh, this would get at an age-old question of collection efficiency of systems. And uh, I think that still remains a question mark. Uh, and also, I think for California, uh, there isn't much waste uh, disposed of and in current conditions elsewhere also in systems without gas collection systems. So I think um, a emissions from a landfill without a gas collection system may be applicable to something an old site, a closed site, something like that. But again, under current conditions, I don't think um, there is much in the way of um, facilities without gas collection. And again, we did not test um, a facility that did not have a gas collection system. And um, if Jean is still, on, still online, I actually wanted to ask her in our last few minutes to see if she had any additional comments and also if she wants to say anything um, about this part of the uh, discussion. Uh, yes, I'm still on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to stress that each landfill site is unique in terms of its emissions because each site has a distinctive location in terms of its latitude or longitude, which are affected by climate which is one of the major drivers for emissions. But emissions are also determined by the site-specific thickness and physical properties of the cover materials and, as you were just talking about, the uh, presence of an engineered gas extraction system. So um, it becomes a site-specific determination in terms of what the emission signatures are for specific gases. Um, as well as the strength of the source of those gases within the landfill itself. And there are a lot of things we don't know about the high global warming potential gases in terms of their landfill behavior under the anaerobic conditions in the landfill. Um, there might be chemical degradation reactions. There can be sorption. Um, there's a whole host of processes which haven't even really been um, thought about as yet. It's complicated. Thank, Thank you, Gene. Uh, Gene, this is Chuck White. I question while I got you on the Hi, line, Chuck. if I could. Um, uh, how much uh, is your CalMIM model being applied uh, to landfills these days? Uh, just out of curiosity, issue seems to keep coming back up uh, as California progresses to uh, uh, divert uh, effectively all of the organics from landfills, and I'm, I'm wondering if that. Uh, if there is some further information from the use of your CalMIM model to either uh, support that or question that? Well, we published a California-specific study last year, right. um, which, you may, which you may know about, yes. where um, we actually redid the California inventory for all of the uh, California sites using a nice CalRecycles database and um, compare that with data kindly supplied by uh, Air Resources Board to using the current inventory, which is based on the uh, methane uh, generation model contained in the IPCC 2006 uh, National Greenhouse Gas Inventory Guidelines based on a first-order decay model for methane generation. Um, so that information is out there. We also compared uh, within that same paper uh, to measured emissions at 10 California landfill sites in addition to the two sites we worked extensively at, at during the development of the CalMEM model. And uh, it's um, 
we also then uh, finished an international field validation of the CalMIM model using uh, 40 different cover materials from uh, 29 different sites on six different continents. So um, the, the final reports are done. The papers are coming out. Um, and I, my sense is that it's being used probably more in a research sense than in an inventory sense. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, it is a, a very simple model with a, about a 10-minute learning curve. So it can be readily applied to inventory as well. Right. Okay, good. Well, I may follow up with you further on that separately. Thank you. Sure. And, and uh, we have uh, an emailed question that's coming in. So I'll uh, read the question. Question. Similar to auto shredder waste, can uh, foam blowing agents or foam expansion agents be treated to suppress fugitive F gas emissions during disposal? Can, can you treat them to suppress? Um, interesting question. I'm not sure. <laughs> um. Chemically, I'm not certain of the details. That would be outside my expertise. I just think about a system physically, you could encapsulate it in some regard uh, and have, you know, a bubble buried in the landfill or something like that, that or certain disposal areas that are uh, devoted to this sort of thing uh, as an option. Right, yes. Uh, very flexible, durable bubble. But um, chemically, I think there could be, or painting them, or some sort of coating on them. Uh, I, I don't know the details. Nice angle, though. Uh, this is Glenn Gallagher from Air Resources Board. I've just uh, uh, probably, um, my thoughts on this are you, you, it would be very difficult to actually treat the F gases, but what you can do in a highly emissive source, such as a refrigerator, freezer, insulation, what you can cut it off in slabs instead of, instead of grinding up the entire appliance, which is actually done in uh, the comprehensive appliance recycling facilities in the state. So you cut off using a handsaw slabs, and then you would either landfill the entire slab or you can incinerate it. So I guess that is a form of treatment where you would try to um, you know, uh, decrease the F gas emissions that way. But other than that, I'm not aware of anybody that is treating the, uh, the, uh, the foam other than as, as auto shredder fluff. Time's just about. Um, okay, I guess our time is just about up, and I'd like to thank everybody who attended and, and all the people on the webcast uh, for this, uh, you know, the potent greenhouse gas emissions from, from waste uh, appliance and building foam in landfills. And it, this is pretty much a landmark study, I think, that. Uh, Jim and, and Nosley and Gene have done a great job on, and uh, uh, we hope some papers come out of this. And, and uh, Air Resources Board, thanks you for your hard work on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you.